Now, a few years ago, hundreds of people from around the world attended the Flat Earth International Conference in Edmonton. Not as a joke, mind you, very serious-minded people, none of whom were scientists. They felt completely justified in their beliefs because it made sense to them. It is the perfect example of the Dunning-Kruger effect. People with limited knowledge of a subject feeling quite certain that they know exactly what's going on. They don't know what they don't know. In the U.S., about 10,000 people will audition for the American Idol television show in every city. Each year, the show allows 56 contestants to compete, and that list is cut down to 24 in the first episode. Hundreds of thousands of people come to the open auditions. Those are lottery ticket odds, but people still try out. And of course, while many are quite talented, though no, not talented enough to make the stringent cut, tens of thousands more are hopelessly untalented and simply unaware of that fact. Now, you may have heard the Dunning-Kruger effect discussed in popular media, but most of the time, we get it, come away with the wrong idea. The Dunning-Kruger effect is not a way of saying that a person isn't smart. The Dunning-Kruger effect happens to everyone. The scientist who studied the phenomenon, Dunning and his graduate student, Kruger, showed that when we lack knowledge and skill in a particular area, we tend to overestimate our own competence on the subject. You might be very smart and skilled in many areas, but no one is an expert in everything. For instance, there is an endless array of topics upon which I have little knowledge. Auto repair, billiards, cardiology, uh, the list goes on and on. If I ever express an opinion on any of these topics, just ignore me. Basically, when we have a low ability in something, we do not possess the skills needed to recognize our own incompetence and we overestimate our capabilities. The Dunning-Kruger formula is simple. If you know a little bit about something, you don't have the ability to recognize that you don't know enough. Or, to put it more simply, the more we think we know, the less we realize just how much we don't know. In fact, what uh, the research showed was a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing, because if you know nothing about a subject, uh, you know what you, that you know nothing. For instance, I know nothing about changing out transmissions in cars. Ask me about it, and I'll tell you, I have no data to share with you at all. But if you have a small amount of knowledge about a subject, that's when you're the most likely to completely overestimate your capabilities in that area. And what's funny is the Dunning-Kruger effect also affects experts. Because when you excel in a given area, you're likely to think that the task is simple for everyone, which leads experts to underestimate their abilities. That's why humility is a sign of expertise. While supreme confidence is a warning sign of incompetence. Take, for instance, the rock group The Monkees. The actors who were hired to pretend to be the band The Monkees in the Monkees TV series inevitably concluded that being big pop stars, they should be writing their own songs. And so they told Neil Diamond and Carole King and the best composers of the 1960s to get lost. Well, the Dunning Kruger effect led Davey and Mickey and Petey and Mike to think that they could be successful top 40 composers because they didn't have the requisite knowledge to know that history would most assuredly prove them wrong. And I, I want to repeat that this is not a matter of people being too dense to recognize their shortcomings. It's much more pernicious than that. When we have low competence in a particular area of expertise, that incompetence robs us of the mental ability to realize just how inept we are. This is as true for you and I as it is for the monkeys. So there's an old phrase from the 19th century, too clever by half, which is to say, too smart for your own good. 
You can be so clever that you can both intimidate and bore others with your knowledge, wrecking your relationships. And the, and the phrase is often applied to children because gifted kids can be so smart that they spend all their time looking for ways to get around the rules. And this also works on a global level where we become so smart as a species that we create chemicals and produce energy using processes that destroy the environment we live in. I'm not saying that being smart doesn't have its advantages, it obviously does, but nevertheless, you really can be too clever by half. And if even experts can fall into this trap, how much more can it affect those who are given great wisdom? And this leads us back to the story of Solomon, the wise king of Israel. When Solomon became king of Israel, following in the footsteps of his father David, Solomon could have asked God for anything, wealth or power or long life, but instead he asked for wisdom. And God, very pleased with this request, granted Solomon not only wisdom, but also the riches and honor beyond measure. And Solomon became known far and wide for his wisdom, and people came from all over the world to seek his counsel. But even Solomon, with all his God-given wisdom, didn't know what he didn't know. The Dunning-Kruger effect isn't just at work in ordinary people. It's also, it also affected the wisest man who ever lived. Solomon's wisdom was a thimbleful compared to that of God. Solomon could not see the hidden things of God and did not have the humility to see it. He didn't realize that his political alliances, many of which were sealed by marriages to idol-worshipping foreign women, would lead him away from God. By marrying women from other nations and allowing them to bring their gods into Israel, Solomon introduced the seeds of idolatry that would eventually fracture the nation. His wisdom didn't include the foresight to see how small compromises can lead to massive and terrible consequences. Solomon couldn't see the depravity in the human heart. He was wise in governance, but he was blind to the subtle ways in which his own heart was being drawn away from God. And by allowing the worship of pagan gods in Israel, Solomon opened the doors to spiritual forces that would destroy his relationship with God and tear his kingdom apart. After Solomon's death, his son Rehoboam would inherit a kingdom so weakened by Solomon's compromises that within a short time the United Kingdom of Israel would be split for all time, inevitably dooming the ten tribes of the north to be lost forever. Solomon knew the law, but he didn't fully live by it. He compromised on God's standards, thinking that he could manage the consequences. He underestimated the seriousness of sin and the importance of remaining fully devoted to God. So Solomon's story serves as a powerful reminder that even the wisest among us can fall into the trap of overconfidence when it comes to the hidden things of God. Now, unlike Solomon, however, we are lucky because the hidden things of God have been revealed to us in the gospel. In our passage from Romans today, we read that God is preeminent, crucial to our lives, because it is God's saving power, the gospel. The Apostle Paul goes on to tell us that, therefore, ungodliness comes down to intentionally suppressing the truth, which is obvious in nature. Now, we might think that this would mean that an overt, outspoken atheist is somehow the only person who is ungodly, since that person would appear to be suppressing the truth. But actually, the apostle tells us that God's eternal power and divinity, though hidden, can be deduced just by looking at the things God has made. Paul tells us that everyone knows God because they can see God in nature and in the faces of the people around them, and despite this fact, most people reject God and call this rejection of God wisdom. And then foolishly, they decide to worship any number of other distractions, though they don't realize that it's worship. People worship other religions, yes, but they also worship movies and movie stars, sports and sports cars, race, uh, racing cars and, and their drivers, singers and musicians, even science and great scientists. There's no end to the prospective idols in our world today, including the ones on American Idol. This is the ultimate Dunning-Kruger effect, because people have a sufficient evidence to know that there is a God, 
but then they rely on their own understanding and invent a God that in the end looks back at them from within the bathroom mirror. This is why it is so important that we read lots of scripture together in church. The Apostle Paul tells us in Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. The Dunning-Kruger effect tells us that a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing because it makes us overconfident. For that reason, I encourage each of you, not just here, when you hear the word on Sundays, but to dive into it throughout the week. Make it a daily practice so that you're not just familiar with the Bible, but deeply grounded in it. In 2 Timothy, Paul writes, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. And the key word here is proficient. To be proficient at something is to be able to do it at a higher than average standard. And you'll know that you're proficient in the word of God when you know enough to be humbled by how much you don't know. That is when you know you've begun to gain godly wisdom. When we don't read the Bible and have opinions about God, we risk the Dunning-Kruger effect. Without spending time in the Bible or in prayer for devotion, how can we truly understand what God is trying to teach us? When we don't know what we don't know, we risk being affected by Dunning-Kruger. And just as those who confidently proclaim that the earth is flat are missing the bigger picture, we too can miss God's greater wisdom when we rely too much on our own understanding. So let's seek God's wisdom in all things, recognizing that our understanding is always limited without God. And as we reflect on Solomon's mistakes, we're reminded that true wisdom begins with humility and the fear of the Lord. Remember, on any subject, any subject, if you approach it with humility, you're already acting like an expert. If you say to yourself, the more I learn, the more I know how much I don't know, then you can't become overconfident. Humility isn't just something we do to be a moral person. Humility is the defining character trait of a wise person. The book of Proverbs is filled with wise sayings, and none greater than this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not rely on your own insight. In all your ways acknowledge God, and God will make straight your paths. Amen.